Hey guys, welcome to this week's FAQ and Freebie Friday. Now before we begin, if you're new to the channel, these videos are all about answering your health related questions. So if you have a question concerning your health, something regarding nutrition, diet, herbalism, supplements, or really anything related to health and wellness, and you would like our help in answering your questions, all you have to do is leave those questions in the comment section below, and we'll be answering those based on popularity, the questions that we feel be most beneficial to the group as a whole, and the questions that we are of course capable of answering. And something else really fantastic about these videos is that every week from the comment section, we select one lucky person to win a free bag of tonic herbs or medicinal mushrooms of their choice. So even if you don't have a health related question for us this week, but you're interested in winning some free herbs, all you need to do to be entered to win is simply subscribe to the YouTube channel, give this video a thumbs up, and then just drop any old comment in the comment section. And with all that out of the way, let's get to this week's questions. Okay, so getting to our first question, this question actually comes from an email that we've received recently, and I figured that I'd answer this here on the FAQ because anybody else that might see this research and have similar questions, I would want to also extend this information their way to clear up any confusion. And the email reads, I have recently purchased your broken spore reishi powder and was wondering if you guys ever had anybody express worry in using your powdered product. The reason I ask is because I've done a bit of research on my own just to educate myself and I have found a couple of articles that mention the use of powdered forms of reishi mushroom that have been associated with liver damage or toxicity. Are you aware or have you heard about this? So she went on to express a couple more of her concerns and she linked a couple of the studies that she saw referencing or associating reishi mushroom powder with liver damage. So naturally, I think anyone would be concerned if they saw studies like this, but there are some very simple explanations for these particular studies. So first and foremost, some of the studies that she shared with me, she just misread. So this is common or easy to do. Sometimes I'll even misread a study from the get-go and then I have to really go in and read it. So if you're not familiar with reading clinical studies, first of all, if you're not just familiar with all the terminology, if you're not familiar with how studies are set up and how they're done, or just you have no practice in reading them, it's, I think, very easy to confuse how studies are worded and just overlook what they're actually trying to say. So this study, for example, she thought that it was talking about reishi causing liver toxicity. What they were actually demonstrating is the liver protective effects of reishi. So basically, in this study, they induced liver toxicity using a toxic substance and then injected reishi following, and they found that the antioxidant effects of reishi actually mitigated some of the toxicity and damage caused by that toxin, basically concluding what has been said about reishi for so many thousands of years, which is that it's a protective a substance to the liver. So some of the studies she just misread, but I totally understand. I'll do the same thing sometimes and I'll read it uh, off first glance and think that it's talking about the opposite. And that's just something that's easy to do. These medical journals and studies contain tons and tons of information and a lot of medical terminology. And in my experience, if you don't understand the terminology of a subject, you will become confused. Sometimes you'll just skip through reading stuff. I find that whenever I'm reading something, if I don't understand a single term in it, I might just skip a couple of lines, and this can ultimately lead to misunderstandings and confusions. So there's a couple of reasons I think people overlook these things or just misread stuff in general. It makes perfect sense. I'm not trying to put you down. It just, it, medical journals are very complex and complicated, and unless you're a physiologist or a doctor, or you're somebody like me who just reads them all day long, it's easy to overlook them. So moving along, she shared this study as well, which actually talks about hepatitis being associated with reishi mushroom powder. Now this study is actually saying that reishi mushroom powder can have a toxic effect on the liver. However, if you read into the fine details of it, here's what it says. First of all, the study is talking about one person who took a reishi powder and experienced liver toxicity. Additionally, they found that other patients who had taken other therapeutic agents and traditionally boiled the reishi mushroom experienced no toxic effects. So now this study actually is not surprising to me at all or probably any herbalist that you would show it to because it clearly points out one major flaw, which is that the person who experienced liver toxicity used a raw reishi powder. All mushrooms are toxic in their raw form. 
most herbs are actually toxic in their raw form. This is why most vegetables, plant foods, you need to cook them to make them actually digestible and bioavailable. This is true for a wide variety of herbs. It's true for a wide variety of vegetables. Most leafy greens like kale, collard, chard, and even beans and legumes, they all contain plant toxins, which in their raw form make them highly indigestible. This is a protective mechanism in the behalf of the plant in the natural world. But if you ingest them without cooking them or preparing them properly, you will experience digestive issues and toxic effects. So looking specifically at reishi mushroom or any mushroom for this matter, mushrooms in their raw form are not digestible, especially mushrooms like reishi mushrooms or polypores, which are so fibrous and tough. If you were to try to eat that thing raw, it just sit in your stomach like a block of styrofoam causing toxic effects and gastrointestinal upset and inflammation. But even softer mushrooms like white button mushrooms or oysters, these things should also not be consumed raw because all mushrooms contain a protein known as chitin, which makes it indigestible by the human digestive tract. Human digestive tracts do not secrete the enzyme that breaks down chitin, and anything that you can't digest is gonna have a toxic effect in your body. So again, this is commonly known in any practice of Eastern herbalism at least, that you need to properly prepare or decoct your herbs. And certain herbs and certain mushrooms have different preparation methods. So really a master herbalist knows all these various techniques, they know how to combine herbs, and more importantly, how to prepare them so that way they're not toxic. So Hoshuwu, for example, was traditionally made into a decoction with like a black bean soup to make it more digestible and non-toxic. There's other similar studies that show that raw Hoshuwu or Fo tea, the unprepared version of Hoshuwu can actually have similar liver toxic effects. But again, any plant substance is usually gonna be toxic in its raw form and knowing how to cook it or how to prepare it is essential. So again, reishi mushroom or any mushroom necessarily is gonna be toxic in its raw form. So if you're getting a product that's just a raw powdered form, you need to actually boil that or decoct it and then strain it out. I think the only reason they're even powdered anyways in a raw form rather than just kept in slices is for the convenience of storage. A couple of ounces of sliced reishi might take up a space this big, but in a powder might take up this much. So you need to know what sort of product you're getting. So a lot of what I'm talking about you can learn in this video in more detail. Basically the difference between a powdered extract and an actual raw powdered herb or mushroom. So all of our products are extracted powders. So it's a newer type of technology in a sense, because traditionally you knew you got an extract because it was usually in liquid form. So it had been decocted previously or turned into an alcohol extraction. And if it were not, and it was in its raw form, it'd usually still be in a whole form or a chopped up or sliced form. And that was the easiest way to tell. But our particular products are a powdered extract where it's made into a decoction. It's a hot water or cold water extraction or sometimes an alcoholic or a dual extraction in the case of our reishi powder. And then it's evaporated through certain technology that makes a powder. So that way you have the best of both worlds. And that's why you'll notice our powders, if you put them in the water, they sort of dissolve instantly because they're actually extracted powders. They don't have any of the other like insoluble fibers or residues left behind. And then in terms of the reishi spore powder, this is a different product altogether. The spore powder is the reproductive substance, the spores that literally cover the top of the reishi only for a certain period out of the time that it's growing to reproduce. So this stuff you can actually, even in nature, wipe right off and lick it and eat it. It's completely digestible. The only thing is that to make it more digestible, like pine pollen, if you were to consume too much of it, you might get a little bit of gastrointestinal upset. But to crack the cell wall, you can freeze it or put it through some sort of temperature regulating process that opens it up and makes it more bioavailable. So our reishi spore powder is first of all a spore powder. It's not the same thing as the raw powdered herb or even the extracted powdered mushroom. And it's also a cracked cell wall version. So you're not gonna have any of these issues with that product. So that should answer the majority of your questions. But one of the last things I just wanted to touch on as I did in the email is that just because something raises your liver enzymes does not indicate automatic liver damage or toxicity. Many things could raise liver enzymes that are not damaging. For example, let's say you take something like reishi that might be freeing up the stored estrogen in your body and your liver is what solubilizes that estrogen to be excreted out of the body through the kidneys. So if you're taking a substance that might be assisting your body in eliminating toxins, 
So if it has a detox-like effect, this might temporarily raise the liver enzymes because your liver now is working a little bit more to remove toxins already in your body. So that's different than taking a toxic substance and your liver's enzyme activity levels are rising trying to detox the toxin that you took compared to something that's actually eliminating and helping free up store toxins already in your body. And that's one of the major things that reishi does. It helps to metabolize excess estrogen in the body. If you have stored toxic substances already in your liver, then the reishi mushroom is gonna go in there and help your liver sort of cleanse those out so it can clean up the liver and this might temporarily cause an increased rise in liver enzymes. But that doesn't mean your liver is damaged. That's only one biomarker of potential liver damage. It doesn't mean automatic liver damage. There's other more important factors like albumin levels amongst many others. So just if you see a study that says, you know, it raised liver enzymes when you took reishi mushroom, that doesn't mean that it's causing liver damage. All right, so getting to our next question, this one reads, hi Nick, does a vitamin D deficiency lead to hair loss or thinning and is it reversible? The short answer is yes, a vitamin D deficiency could be a major contributing factor to hair loss and hair thinning and there's a couple of reasons why. So first of all, vitamin D3 is a regulatory substance for nearly every cell in the body. Almost every cell and tissue in your body has a receptor for vitamin D and uses it for specifically the regeneration of the cell. So it helps to promote the production of new stem cells, which ultimately make up a tissue. So your hair follicles are also made up of stem cells, which make the cells that make the hair follicle and the hair follicle makes the hair. And ultimately you need vitamin D3 for the production of those stem cells to grow your hair. So it's a major regulatory substance for everything in the body, not just the hair, but the bones, the teeth, and all of your tissues really, even your skin tissue. So a deficiency of vitamin D3 in this way, the most fundamental way could contribute to the lack of hair growth because it's a cofactor for stem cell growth in the hair follicle. But there's so many things that vitamin D3 does in terms of promoting metabolism, overall energy production, and all these things that systemically benefit the hair. Remember the hair is just one aspect, one mini organ that's part of your whole body. So when you look at vitamin D3's broad range effects, it makes a lot of sense that you would need vitamin D3 for good health and obviously good hair growth. So one thing that vitamin D3 does is it's actually important in the synthesis of testosterone. So oftentimes these things are interrelated. If you have low vitamin D3 levels, this can result in low testosterone production. And low testosterone, despite the DHT myth, is actually a major reason that people experience hair loss and hair thinning. So one of the symptoms of low testosterone is thinning of the hair, hair loss, uh, lo just bad hair quality altogether. So there are studies that show that testosterone applied topically can directly stimulate hair growth. And I think the simplest way to look at it is testosterone is an anabolic hormone. It promotes the anabolism side of the metabolism, so the growth side of the metabolism. And when you are deficient in things like testosterone, your metabolism tends to shift to a more catabolistic a uh, low energy or energy deficient state, which negatively affects all aspects of your body, particularly the hair follicle, which is a highly energetic demanding mini organ. So you really want a high rate of metabolism to produce hair. The hair follicle, like the skin being, the scalp being part of the skin, has an incredibly high turnover rate. So your hair uh, produces very rapidly. So you're growing new hairs and losing new hairs almost on a daily basis. Just like your skin, you're always shedding skin cells and producing new skin cells. So the health of the skin and the hair, because the scalp is part of the skin, are incredibly dependent on a high functioning metabolism to ensure this proper turnover rate. Because if the metabolic rate turns down, then this turnover rate uh, becomes slower. So basically your hair is producing or using more energy than it's producing, and this can cause hair issues. Other reasons that a vitamin D3 deficiency might lead to hair loss is because vitamin D3 is synergistic with all of the other fat soluble vitamins. So you need vitamin D3 for the proper metabolization of these other vitamins, particularly vitamin K2. And a vitamin K2 deficiency could lead to scalp calcification. There's a pretty direct correlation between deficient levels of K2 and overall soft tissue calcification, whether that's arterial calcification or scalp calcification. So getting in enough vitamin D3 and K2, as well as all of your fat solubles, 
is essential for good hair growth. Other ways that a vitamin D3 deficiency might contribute to hair loss. One, D3 is a natural antagonist to estrogen, and estrogen is a major contributing factor to hair loss. So if your D3 levels are low, that could just be one less defense against high estrogen and its toxic effects. Also, what's the major source of vitamin D3 in the natural world? Sunlight, and sunlight is essential for good hair growth. I've seen this in my personal experience, but there's actual studies that point out experiments that show that people's hair in the summer is significantly nicer than in the winter. So the sun has so many ways in which it promotes hair growth, but some of them is the D3, so it helps provide the D3 that you need for all the things I've mentioned. Sunlight also increases dopamine, and dopamine naturally antagonizes prolactin, one of the major hormones that causes hair loss. And then at the same time, the sunlight actually can directly act on melanin receptors in the scalp, which can promote not just the growth of the hair, but it can increase the hair's antioxidant capacity, as well as promote the pigmentation, so the healthy pigmentation, which actually just means that your hair follicle has uh, more fibers, protein fibers around the shaft. So ultimately, if you're losing hair color, your hair is probably also getting thinner as well, which is why you can see the hair is uh, lighter because there's less pigmented fiber surrounding the hair shaft. So there's tons of ways in which a vitamin D3 deficiency can contribute to hair loss, but I would just say if you're experiencing any sort of hair loss, get outside more. I've personally seen in my own observation that a lot of the manual labor workers Farmers, construction workers, people that are outside a lot, landscapers, tend to have better quality hair overall compared to people that work inside, that are on the computer all day, they're IT guys, tech guys, and generally anybody that doesn't get outside that much. So perhaps even more than a vitamin D3 deficiency, it could be a sunlight deficiency. I largely speculate from my research and observation that the more I learn about the physiology of the hair, the more that I look and observe, the more I see that something as simple as sunlight therapy could dramatically improve the quality of your hair. So if you're not getting outside, make it an effort. Even if your lifestyle is not set up around it, you know, I work indoors, but I set up my lifestyle to be outside. I'm outside about half the time that I am inside. So anybody can do it. I don't care if you have a job where you're working inside, you can take a lunch break outside, you can walk to work or bike to work, and you can probably bike ride home if it's in reasonable distance. There's so many things you can do to still be outside and get adequate sunlight. Keep in mind that the best time to be outside too actually is during sunrise and sunset. So even if you're not outside during these peak hours, which is nice for the tan and the feel good warmth of the sun, the light that is emitted during sunrise and sunset are actually the same wavelengths of infrared and red light therapy, which are some of the most healing, regenerative wavelengths of light and can actually stimulate hair growth. So get outside for the sunrise. Wake up a half hour early and just go sit and watch the sunrise and then go find somewhere to watch the sunset. Do that every day and that could have a beneficial effect on the hair and just generally get outside and get as much sun as you can without burning. Otherwise, if you're gonna try to get vitamin D3 through supplementation, seek foods. You're only gonna find D3 and K2 in animal foods, unfortunately. You can only get D1 and K1 in plant foods, which are poorly synthesized, and they act on different aspects of the physiology. So K1 doesn't affect the soft tissue calcification, only K2 does. So you just wanna make sure that you're getting them through the right food sources, but ultimately I'll just say, get outside and get the sunshine on your head, on your skin. All right guys, that brings this week's FAQ and Freebie Friday to a close. If you've enjoyed it, be sure to give it a thumbs up. If you're interested in winning some free herbs or if you have some questions for us, all you have to do is leave those questions in the comment section below. Don't forget to subscribe to the YouTube channel if you haven't yet already. And if you're interested in learning more beyond our YouTube channel, we do have an online wellness academy that is full of wonderful online courses for improving various aspects of your health. For the person that's struggling with hair loss, I would highly recommend getting the Forever Healthy Hair course. Otherwise, we do have tons of free resources here on the YouTube channel, as well as on our blog. Both the Online Wellness Academy and our blog you can find in the description box below.